Okay. Right. So uh, I'm not Nikos Eftimiu. Uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, Nikos uh, is not feeling well at all, and so he thought he would be here by noon, but he isn't. <laughs> but I have his slides, <laughs> so I'll do my best. I, I try to look at it over. Uh, Obviously, we did talk about it before, what should be in the slides, but I, I'll do my best. So I apologize if this isn't up to uh, normal standards, uh, because I'm, sh I'm sure Nikos would be doing a lot better than I'm going to do now. So, uh, so like before, we thought it would be useful to give you some basic introduction on PET. I know you've, you've heard two days of lots of fancy stuff, but this is much more basic, yes, and that hopefully allows you then, when you look back at the fancy stuff from the previous days, to understand it a bit more. And then uh, we'll, we'll try and explore some of that in, uh, in the exercises. So uh, I'm not going to talk about filter back projection and so on, although he had that in his slides, but we decided to remove it uh, for time reasons. And also, uh, we're not really all that interested in filter back projection anymore these days. So anyway, he's going to, to talk about iterative or statistical image reconstruction. Um, so uh, we're just giving you basics on the physics and uh, see how that maps onto surf functionality. A bit like whatever, uh, a lot like uh, Christoph talked before. So in, in statistical image reconstruction, we, so, we sort of say you need to have a model uh, of probability. Because that's why it's statistical. And so the model that we normally start off with is saying, uh, I have some measured data and with that data, this particular image is more likely than anything else, yes? And therefore, I'm going to maximize that probability function. However, um, the uh, probability function for an image, given the data, is kind of a hard thing to do. And it's much easier to write it in terms of, uh, sorry, uh, in terms of the other conditional probability. And then later on, we're going to add prior information to go back to this one. So the second line there is, says, what is the likelihood to measure some data if you have a particular image? And that is a much more intuitive concept, yes? I, I, if my, is this my patient, what am I going to measure? And what is the noise on those measurements? And so that's what all our work is based on. Um, and so, for practical reasons, you, you have heard that in, in Cyprian's talk as well. Uh, you know, our image is obviously, our patient doesn't consist of a number of voxels, or at least you hope he doesn't. Uh, so in, in practice, you can't estimate continuous distributions unless you know a lot of math. And uh, so because we don't, we, we discretize everything. And you can discretize it in, in many different ways. And the uh, basic concept there is that you say, my continuous image is a sum of weighted basis functions. And those basis functions can be uh, many different things. On the other hand, our measured data is always discrete. We have a discrete detector in most cases on our PET scanners. You, you can buy a PET scanner that has a continuous detector, but uh, uh, m most of them have discrete crystals. And the measured data, moreover, is also discrete in the sense that it counts. Yes, it's not uh, in CT you measure a current or something like that in your detector. In, in PET or SPECT, we say we count uh, the number of uh, coincidences in PET that is uh, in a certain time. So from this, we need to find out what our probability model is. And then what we're going to try and do is uh, maximize the uh, likelihood with this information in there for a, a, a discrete image. And so in some sense, this is the, the first bit of regularization that you do. You have to choose your basis functions. And if you take really tiny, tiny voxels, well, that's going to be hard to estimate and your image is going to be very noisy, yes? And if you take really large ones, you're going to assume that your patient consists of a number of blocks, which is also not good. And so that's the first choice that you make. So here is run a few different uh, basis functions. So suppose you have a continuous function that looks like that. Uh, traditionally, we do it in voxels, but you could 
you, you could use some, some uh, B spline, quadratic B spline. In this case, some people try to use cubic B splines, or you can do something based on anatomy, which is the kernel stuff from, for tomorrow. Yes, yeah? so you, you can say in some locations, I, I know that I don't have a lot of structure, therefore I will choose my basis function a bit wider than in other locations, right? But everything you're going to see today is just voxelized uh, basis functions. Okay, so uh, what are our pet data then in, in good approximation, you can think about that as line integrals. So you have some activity there distributed in your, in your scanner and uh, you're going to measure the total number of counts between two detectors. And ignoring physics, that is going to be uh, proportional to the total amount of uh, activity that you sum up in all the voxels on, the, on that line, yes? Um, and uh, <clears throat> we then store that in something that we call an acquisition data, not an acquisition data uh, object. And uh, in, if you have a single slice, we tend to stick that into a sinogram. And many uh, people get very confused about sinogram. So we have a few slides to try and explain you what that is, but it's not really all that important in a way. It's only important if you want to look at your images, your measured data, what do they mean? But uh, if you have an acquisition model that goes from an image to data, you in some sense don't need to care that it's a sinogram, yes or no. Yes, but it's, it's kind of handy. And so I, we have a few slides on there uh, that try and explain that. So uh, clearly you have lines through all this object and he's, he's drawn here a scanner that consists of a number of blocks. And uh, if you have blocks like this, you will have gaps in your sinogram, and therefore you, you sort of see holes in, in the data on the right. Yes, now are there are diagonal lines I'm not going to go into, but on the Siemens MMR, for instance, there are those gaps, and if you look at the measured data, you will see all those diagonal lines because there's, there's no detector there. Uh, so, Something should happen now, ideally. Right, okay. So you have all those lines and maybe you can see it on the, um, on the right in the sinogram. What he's done is for each of, each of, each line corresponds to a dot in your sinogram, yes? So the measured data is total number of counts along this line or between two crystals. And these lines are all in the center of the going through the center of the scanner and they all end up at the center line of your sinogram. So what is in a sinogram is uh, if you go up and down, they will be different directions. And if you go left and right, they will go different direct uh, distances from the center. So these guys are all through the center. And then when I go, uh, I have a line off center, then it becomes a cross. You see on the top left there, there's a little red cross that might be somewhat hard to see. It's over there, right? And different angles again go up and down. So sinogram is, is something distance and angle related. Now, why is it called a sinogram? Uh, okay. So, uh, if you take an image which is uh, a point source, or in actually, I guess there are two point sources here, point sources, but I, I can see only one. Uh, the other one must be lower intensity, I just can't see it. And you, you look at your sinogram, what you see in, in, it sort of has a sign shape. And if you do a bit of geometry, then you can find out why that is, but that's the origin of the name. Uh, so if, if you're a trained pet person and you know, you know you have point sources and you look at this stuff, you can do image reconstruction in your mind. You don't even need to do deep learning. But uh, in, in practice, it becomes a little bit hard. Yeah, so don't worry about this too much, but there are some exercises later on that allow you to uh, put in your source in a location and see what is the measured data, what does it look like? So you can, you can experiment with that. Um, Something which is 
kind of confusing in, in PET is that we talk about 2D PET and 3D PET and all of them are 3D. Uh, so the image is always 3D because we, we, met, we as you, it's a sort of a side view of the scanner, we measure always 15 centimeters or, or whatever of the patient. And you have an explorer, you measure two, two meters of the patient. Uh, but uh, if we talk about 2D PET, we say we really are interested only in lines that go in a plane, if you like, and therefore the name 2D. So the, the acquisition data is like a stack of sinograms, and uh, you can reconstruct each of those independently if you want to. Yes? You always have this diagram, but do any scanners actually still have uh, the separate? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess if you have an old scanner, you might still have this stuff, but recent scanners, the, the PETMR scanners, don't have the, uh, the SEPTA anymore. So it's a good question. So we, we, we say we have 3D PET because we allow lines in, in all possible directions now. And the advantage of that is that obviously you have you detect more lines, therefore your sensitivity will be higher, and you will uh, hopefully construct less noisy images. But the problem with having this is that you have more scatter and so on, and you need to hard, work harder to do your uh, modeling. And therefore, for a long time, people didn't do this, but now we know how to do that. So the main reason that we have this slide here is that uh, if you have 3D data, uh, you have far, obviously, your data set is much larger, and therefore it's also going to take uh, more time to reconstruct the data. And what we can, in some sense, you have a stack of sinograms for all the possible directions, if, if you see. And so what, we, what you can then do is say, I'll try and from that data, I'll go and back to what the 2D scanner uh, acquisition would have measured. And, that's a data reduction, therefore you lose some information normally, but then everything becomes faster. And uh, we will be doing, I think, in, maybe not today, but in, in one of the exercises tomorrow, if you find, oh, things are a bit slow here, then you can do this trick and then everything will be uh, about 10 times slower, uh, faster, because you have 10 times less data to, to handle, yes. So, uh, and if you model all of that correctly, your influence on your image quality is not dramatic, but in the exercise we don't model it correctly. So you, uh, it's essentially a trick to speed it up, and then once you have a decent reconstruction, you can switch to the original data back if you want. Okay, so clearly we have our acquired data. Now we want to reconstruct it and find what the image the, the patient was or, or, the, or the phantom that we have. So to be able to do that, um, we need a model for what the measurement will be. So uh, in, in the notation of Nikos here, the measured data is called Y. And uh, Y? Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, the measurement model is a model for the mean of the data. Yeah? So it's ignoring noise. You, you do repeated measurements, which uh, Arkady Sitek would say you can't, but uh, in, uh, that's what we tend to uh, explain it anyway. And so it's, a, it's an affine model uh, for, for the data. So there is this AIJ there, which is, in some sense, you can think about it as is the probability of having a uh, count being detected in a bit particular detector pair from a particular voxel, yes? And so if you say, I multiply this now with the number of counts or the activity that I have in that voxel, and then I sum it all up, I will have all the counts along the line in that detector pair. And then there might be some background as well, and uh, I'm not going to explain you too much about what that background is today, but uh, it, that's sort of the, the system model that you have. So it's an affine model. In, in MR, we had another acquisition uh, matrix and we didn't have this background term, but otherwise, you know, it's a matrix multiplication. It's sort of the same. Uh, so you need to stick everything you know about your scanner in that acquisition model. And uh, so 
you might say, oh, I'm going to do line integrals, uh, but actually your detectors have a certain size, so you might want to take that into account. You may maybe you want to draw multiple lines, which we can do uh, to between your detector pairs, uh, and so that's sometimes called a tube of response as opposed to a line of response. Yeah? And so we, we can do some of that in our software, not very sophisticated at the moment, but uh, you might see some of that appearing later on. So uh, <clears throat> what we normally have, so our, our normal model that we have in there is a ray tracing thing. So it, it does do line integrals, but what it has to do is, because everything is discretized, it computes the length of intersections and, and adds them all up in, in some sense. So the probability matrix there is proportional to the length of intersection with a particular voxel. And that's called ray tracing. But then that's not a very accurate model, obviously. So you then draw multiple lines to make that a little bit better. OK. You all look stunned. That's maybe uh, because of lunch. But uh, any questions? No? So uh, then lots of stuff happens. That's actually too simple. And so. One of the things kind of important that happens is attenuation. Your, your photons that are coming out, they, uh, they can be deflected. They can be scattered away. Then you do, don't detect them anymore. And so that's, uh, it's listed here as an absorber. The thicker that your material is, the less photons are going to come out at the other side. And this you need to model if you don't. So this on, on the left, you see a reconstructed image where you don't take the attenuation into account and on the right you do and obviously the f the photons from the center of the object have a harder ch chance to uh, escape the object and therefore it looks like you have lower intensity in the middle than you have at the edge but that's not true it's because you didn't take attenuation into account right um, so this you have to stick into your acquisition model and then there are other things uh, related to the detection efficiency of each of each crystal that you have, and 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 maybe timing, uh, dead time could happen, and, and all of those things. Uh, and so you need to to model that, and it's often called normalization, which is uh, if you think about it, I mean normalization is used in many many different uh, ways, different uh, contexts, but here it says. Uh, if you multiply with your normalization factors, you get the data as if you had a perfect scanner. Yes, so it normalizes it to a standard scanner. That's why it's called this way. So it removes any effects of detection efficiency. But in our case, we don't want to normalize. We want to stick it into our acquisition model. And so that means we will first simulate the perfect scanner, and then we will divide by the normalization factors. So we will multiply with efficiency factors, yes? So that explains some of the terminology that, that might get you confused later on. So for instance, if you have measured data, people say, well, I have a normalization file. And then we read that in, but actually, and you, when you display it, it's not the normalization factors, it's the efficiency factors, yes? One, one over the other. And in particular, what you see there on the bottom is one of the sinogram that you would get with the efficiency factors there, and you see these diagonal patterns, that's because of block detectors and so on. And, and for an MMR, you would actually see zeros in some of those lines. And the top one is, if uh, forget about it anyway. They, uh, if you would try and measure that, then it's noisy, but OK. So uh, those are two important effects, so detection efficiencies and attenuation. And you need to put that in your acquisition model. So uh, the top line there is the acquisition model. Now, if you remember the uh, interpretation of the AIJs being probabilities, what you can then think of is the total probability of detection of an event in a voxel. So that means you sum over all the possible detector pairs. right? And this we call the sensitivity image. Yes, it's the sensitivity of the scanner of an event in a particular voxel. And that appears in a number of the algorithms, and you can, you can display it and whatever as well, because it, it tells you a fair amount about your data. So uh, the sensitivity image on the left, this, you can't really see the difference here, but on the left, there is one where you take attenuation into account. And on the right, also detection efficiencies, but 
uh, it's not so important here, but you see that your, your sensitivity is actually quite low in the middle of the scanner because that's because there's a lot of attenuation. Yes, and outside of the patient it's very high, but that's uh, not very useful because there is no patient there. So that's a bit like with the core sensitivities, yes. Uh, he, here, uh, you do, we don't detect any counts from there, but if we would, we would be doing a good job in our case. <laughs> but, okay, does that make sense? So high sensitivity, high chance of detection, and therefore better images, yes. Now, the other bit there on the system model is the, uh, is the background, this R thing. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, in practice, we have to compute this AIJ thing. And so, uh, in what we do in STIR, which underlies SURF uh, for PET, is to, to try and compute this matrix on the fly and then reuse it whenever you do your next iterations. And so therefore it could be that in the beginning everything is a bit slow, but then afterwards it will speed up, yes. And, but you're able to store it, we, we use symmetries and, and, and stuff like that, which I'm, I'm not really going to explain, but otherwise the data size would be too large, or the matrix size. It's sparse and it's symmetric, so you can use rotations and translations. All right, still with me? Okay, so um, this background term. You can, in your data, you can have, uh, what we've talked about at the moment is that the guys on the left there, they, they call true coincidences. Uh, you have two photons coming out and that's what we measure. But one of those photons could have scattered away because of physics, you know. Uh, or we could be detecting a coincidence between two different annihilations. And that's called sometimes a random coincidence or an accidental coincidence. And so uh, is, is displayed here a profile through a, uh, a sinogram. I don't really know what the scatter one and two is, but uh, so it, it sort of gives you a very smooth background to all of your data, right? And if you don't take that into account, you will be making mistakes as well. Now, in none of the exercises, we will be simulating scatter and, we will scatter, and we will also not be taking it away. For that, you will need to ha get release version 2.2, .2, I think, in, he says, in two weeks. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, right. So now we have our acquisition model. We know uh, everything there is to know about the mean of the data. Now you need to have a noise model as well. Yes, because in PET, everything is noisy compared to MR. You can have noise problems in MR as well, obviously, but in PET you always have noise problems. Uh, so you need to model your noise accurately. And, and the approximation that we use is that the data is Poisson distributed. It's not really true. It's binomial, like you heard from Arkady Sitek, but in very, very good approximation, it's Poisson. And if you take the logarithm of, the, of a Poisson distribution, you get the form that you see there. Um, so now we need to maximize this thing. If, if we have no prior information, we say we're going to do maximum likelihood. And there are many different ways of doing that. One is gradient descent, yes, and we will do an exercise later on that. But the traditional algorithm is called maximum likelihood expectation maximization. And I'm not going to explain you why it's called that way. And I'm also not going to explain you the form of the algorithm. But you can sort of see Obviously, our acquisition matrix has to be in there, yes. Um, the, you, you can, if you would take the gradient of your likelihood, uh, because there is a logarithm in there, you will see that it will become the measured data yi divided by the mean of the data. Yes, that's going to happen in your gradient. And so that appears on the right there. So the term that you have there is almost like a gradient. It isn't quite because we make it into a multiplicative algorithm and so on, but you, you, it's almost like a gradient update, but with a factor in front, if you like, yes. And that uh, factor is good because it, it allows to, it gives a very stable algorithm. And also what it does is it, it preserves positivity because you might have noticed there it says, I have a positivity constraint. I want to reconstruct positive images. My activity is always larger than zero. There are some discussions if this is a good thing to do or not, but that's the only thing that we are going to try and that we actually have in serve. 
Okay, so this is kind of an important algorithm. So what he has over here is a, a general scheme for iterative algorithms are going like this. You, you start off with an image estimate, you model it, which we call forward projection. Yes, it's the acquisition model applied to the image. And then you compare it with your measured data. And then you say, oh, I'm fine, or no, I need to go and do a little bit more. Yes, and this Im image update is the formula that you had on the previous slide. And if we try and illustrate that, uh, so in our case, a comparison has related with divisions and back projections and so on. But uh, so what we, what we tend to do is we start with a uniform image. We model it, that gives us a, uh, a uniform sinogram almost, yes. And then we do the quotient of those two, and then we, that's this comparison, and then we bring that back to image space with some back projection stuff, and we get a very smooth image out, and then we iterate that, and it gets sharper and sharper. Your likelihood is going to go up, but after a while, the image becomes noisier and noisier, and you will see that later on, yes? Okay, now, this is great, but it's very slow. Uh, as, you, as you've seen, uh, the likelihood plot there, it goes really fast and then it says yeah. And so that's a feature of the MLEM algorithm. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> to, to solve that, what we tend to do is, there uh, are many things you can do, but the traditional one is to use what we call subsets. And that's kind of important because if you do pet, everybody's talking about subsets all the time. So um, I think, yeah, so what you're saying, this is your whole sign agreement and says, as opposed to taking all of the data to compute my update, I'm just going to look at a few of the views. Yes, I'm going to use a subset of the data and I'll apply my normal formula and I'll give me an update of the image. And then I have another subset of the data and I compute me a new update. Obviously, you do need to do uh, much less calculation if you are doing only a few of the lines. Therefore, it's going to go faster, especially at the beginning. And so, um, so this is an example. If you if you do that uh, on the uh, top row, there is OSCM uh, ordered subsets uh, version of the MLEM algorithm with 40 subsets, and uh, so 40 updates and MLEM also 40 updates. And you roughly get the same image on the right, except that it was 40 times faster, yes? So that's great, that's fantastic. Now, why does it work? It works because we are far away from the actual solution. And if you're far away, you can make lots of approximations. The closer you, you become to the actual solution, your, your approximations are going to get you into trouble. And uh, that's generally seen as a limit cycle. So you, you, you sort of see, ah, this, this subset of the data wants to pull me this way. Oh no, that one wants to go over there. Oh no, this one wants to go over here. And you never converge. So OCM is not a convergent algorithm and you need to do some work to make it to, to converge. And, and there are all algorithms that do converge, obviously, even with subsets. All right. So some of this I hope will become also a little bit clearer when you do the exercises and, and, and you will see some of that happening. Uh, now, uh, first, yeah, OSCM has a limit cycle and also what we haven't shown here is that the, if you keep on iterating and you maximize your likelihood, the image really deteriorates and becomes very, very noisy. So it's an unstable, it's an ill-conditioned inverse problem. You, your your data is noisy, uh, your maximum likelihood estimate is going to be lo lousy. And so what in practice in the clinic still pretty much uh, everybody does is say, I'm going to stop at 40 iterations because that's what I feel like today. Or that's what with all the patients gives me decent images. Yes? And so that's what people tend to do. And there's, there's a huge literature on trying to put that on a solid basis. But not, not, not of that is actually being used and is, uh, has actually been very successful. Um, the, if it's 40 or 50, depends on your patient and so on, but all patients look roughly the same. So in, in clinical practice, it sort of works well. However, we 
we're not happy with that, then we want to say, no, no, let's regularize this solution in a different way. Uh, so ideally, um, regularization says I have an inverse problem, I want to make it more stable. And uh, you can do that in many different ways. And one of them is saying, oh, I'm going to choose different basis functions, like we said at the beginning. Or another way is saying, well, on my pet estimate, I'm, I'm going to do some filtering or so, yes. And another way is to say, well, I know something about my uh, pet image that I haven't taken into account yet. And so, uh, as opposed to saying I'm going to maximize my likelihood, I'm going to maximize the posterior. And you've heard that one before as well. So, uh, this comes from, from base rule. Uh, sorry, the format thing is, is a little bit uh, messed up there, but if you write probabilities, uh, I guess does that work? Uh, over here, yes. If you, if you apply Bayes' rule for given image, sorry, what's the probability of an image given data, you can write it as the probability of data given the image times the probability of the image divided by the probability of the data. And if we want to maximize that, we can forget about the last term. And if we take logarithms of that, we find the thing below there, yes? And so if you do maximum a posteriori type of reconstruction, you do the likelihood term, which we, uh, which we had before, which you can't see. Yes, over here. Plus a term that is a prior, or minus a term that is a penalty. So they, people use different terminology, but they're the same thing, just with a minus sign. Uh, if you maximize your posterior, you want to maximize your prior information. If you regularize, you want to minimize the penalty. Yes, but the same thing. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, there are many different algorithms. And sadly, the one that most people in PET still use is this one. Um, I don't really have the time to, to explain this for you, but the, the reason for that, it's really nice and, and easy to implement. Uh, it's never a good reason. <laughs> but uh, so it takes your MLEM update and it says, I'm going to divide it by a correction factor that depends on the penalty. Uh, now, the eagle-eyed among you will say, oh, I'm going to divide by something, and that something could be zero. And that's going to say, boom, yes? Uh, and so this algorithm uh, is called one step late because it computes the, the prior information in the previous update. But uh, this algorithm works well if you start really close to your solution, and if you start too far away, it, it can just diverge. Uh, but if you're careful, it doesn't, and that's why people still use it, I suppose. I think I'll skip this. Um, so there's some, some examples of uh, reconstructions that you get. It's very noisy if you don't have any penalty at all, and then you put larger and li larger penalties in there, and, and at some point your image will start to make sense. Yes. Okay. So uh, in... Let's say 15 years ago or so, everybody was using uh, quadratic penalties. So uh, I guess I must have skipped over the, over the formula there. But essentially what, what you want to, uh, one of the most obvious priors to use is to say, I believe that the intensity difference between two neighboring voxels is not going to be huge. Yes? Uh, and so you, you penalize the magnitude of this or the square of the magnitude of the difference. And so if you do the square, then it's a quadratic penalty. If you, if you take the norm, then it's called a total variation thing. Now, uh, for, for a long time in PET, we were stuck with doing quadratic because then everything is differential and so on. And now people like Matthias Earhart and so on, they say, oh, you want to use total variation. And I say, I'm not so sure because total variation tries to give you patients which look like this. But generally, I don't anyway, uh, but uh, fine. So you can choose what kind of prior information you use, but how do you optimize this then? And so we have uh, a, an exercise that tries to implement one of those algorithms up to a point only, but then you can continue and do the rest. So uh, 
uh, you probably can't read this, but this is a uh, algorithm by a guy called Di Piero, and the, the authors here have extended it a little bit. Now, uh, yeah, I don't think you can read it, but essentially what it does, it's one of the, it's, it's an early example of a splitting algorithm, if you've heard about that. So what you do is, I do my normal update, in this case an MLEM update, and you say, ooh, this update is going to be a little bit noisy. I'm going to filter it, yes? But I'm going to filter it based on the prior information that I have, not just any arbitrary filter. Um, and the filter there is the second step, or, well, I guess here called the fifth step. Uh, and it, it takes a, a local average of all the voxels with the weight. And what we're going to do in the exercise is to uh, use a constant weight everywhere, but in the paper they say if you choose that weight smartly, then you can do a lot better, obviously. And they give a prescription on how to do that, but that's not part of the exercise at the moment. And then there is a formula to combine your original update with this filtered weight, and so that everything nicely converges. There are other examples, but this is just one of them. Okay, I think this is it. I think he took some slides from over there. Uh, I'm not sure why that's, this is in here, but that's, I believe, what, it, what I have. Uh, okay, any questions? Yes? Can you scheme for the refining of the data in the mode? Sorry, can you repeat the last bit? Yeah, so th there are, there's quite a lot of research on, on rebinning and, and so on of the data. So the, this, the, the simplest one is to say, I have all, the, all of those, so if my scanner is this way, I have all of those lines, I'm going to ignore the tilt angle and I'm going to pretend that it's like this. This is okay for a short scanner, but it's not good for a long scanner. Uh, the... Uh, Fourier rebinning is an algorithm that says, I, I know um, a lot, if, if my data are line integrals, I know a lot of things in Fourier space, and I'm going to do that operation in Fourier space, and that works better, uh, but our data are not line integrals, so it's not really used too much anymore. I mean, some, some people are still looking at it. The other thing that I haven't really talked about that at all is that you have time of flight data, and if you have time of flight data, you have some, you have a timing difference between arrival time of your two photons at your two detectors, and that gives you some location information. Not very accurate, but some. And obviously, if you, if you now say, oh, I, I know, if this is my scanner, I know it sort of comes from here, but I have an angle like that, you can make approximations and still be quite accurate. So Siemens on their, on their new systems, they say, I have time of flight information, I'm going to stick that in my rebinning process and therefore hardly lose any quality at all. Uh, but we're not going to illustrate that one. But yeah, there's a fair amount of, of work on, on rebinning algorithms just because it speeds it up, yeah.